Well, these are all the slides. These are stuff that's on the data tracker, and that's the yeah. ones that we've uploaded from eTechno. Um, so, uh, Bob's thing is on a GitHub repository. It's not in the data tracker, right. so we can't pick it up yet. And I think Bob was intending not to use any slides because we're over a couple of minutes. This is us, we're at the top of the hour. Certainly. Audio test one. Whoever that was speaking, I heard you. Thank you, Bob. That was Jim. <clears throat> what have I done wrong? Just give us a moment here. We're having trouble with. Oh. I thought I thought I had this right. You need to click first there. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, that wasn't done before. I must have missed yep. it. Yeah, and I want to share slides. Thank you, Eric. Okay. Are we there yet? Oh, it's coming. Ah, share. Okay. There we go. Do you want to run things? I decided to run. Do I want to run things? Yes. Apparently, I want to run things. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is uh, the ITF's um, drip session. So anyone who is not interested in DREP, please uh, uh, leave the room or stay, whatever. Um, <clears throat> Jim and me are here as delegates for the real chairs who uh, attend remotely. Um, if you get me the next slide. We are trying to learn how to get to the next slide. Daniel Omed, would you mind sharing the slides if you know how to do it? Um, okay, so, so I think those I are uh, Jim's. Daniel, you need to request sharing a slide with the document icon. Yeah, that's what I I said. Shared preload slides. Ah, yeah. Now something's coming up, and the audio level like this is good enough. Daniel, you are good, but at the desk that we can't hear our um, on-site delegate there. Uh -huh. So do, do you see my slides? Not yet. <clears throat> Not yet. I'm still seeing this section being recorded. 
still says it's Jim Slides. Mm. I think Jim has to stop sharing to let. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I have yeah, the I impression think you will have to un, uh, unshare yours. Just heard some key clacking. Somebody's coming through good. That's me. Hmm. So something good seems yes. to be happening now. I saw something. No, back to the uh, sessions before the slides. Daniel, you are in charge. You should have another window with the left and right buttons. So I, I clicked on something shared. Um, he asked me, I, I had um, a window asking me whether I want to share or not. And I said, yes. Yeah. And now somewhere in another window, you have the right and the left arrow. Mm. Okay, Jim, do it then. Nope. I can try. Um, Doesn't look good for the way team. All right, I have slide control now, guys. I believe. Yes, Adam. I think you have you are in the control. Hopefully. So. There we go. There we go. Oh, See you not well. Slides. Okay, I'm muting. Okay, so um, this is a not well, unless you have never seen it. Um, so take the time to read it. If you have any questions, please come to see to see us or um, contact um, our AD. Next slide. So. Um, these are the rules for um, how we handle this meeting, as hybrid meetings. So we have in-person participant and a remote participant. Um, I, I think that um, we are not that um, um, numerous. Um, and uh, if you have a question, I would say um, you can jump into into the conversation. Um, we are more in a conversation-like uh, uh, type of meeting. Next slide. So you have the agenda, uh, Miteco and other information. Um, next slide. So where we are. Um, so we have um, our first RFC being published. And now we're heavily focused on the Derip architecture. 
Um, the the last call is just being uh, started today, or um, I hope it's, it's it's it might be yesterday for some people. Um, and uh, we we have um, um, I would say one of the main document, the core document, which is the RID that is in working group last call. So next slide. So milestones, um, where we have a, a few other documents that we need to to focus on. Um, it's not the end of the road, but we're pretty good in that. Um, I see the registries. We, we we target to be done by the end of the year. Uh, for the next ITF, we think uh, OAuth uh, might be. Um, a good target. Um, pretty confident about that one. Um, the RID was for December 2021, but um, I mean we're only in March, so um, um, it's an ITF schedule. Next uh, slide. So um, this is the agenda. And I suppose that Shui is going to start. Um, a, 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 has anyone wants to say something uh, before we start the presentation? No? So um, I suggest that um, Shui is uh, presenting the drip arc. Lost control here for a second. Sorry. Uh, what slide deck was it for? Um... That's the arc. Actually, there is, there is no there is no slide for the um, the, the the first two ones. This is just ah, okay. I would say, for the I would say for the editors to report any last minute major issues they have on the um, arc and the uh, and for the read. There's only one slide from from school. so. If there's nothing to report from the uh, from the arc, we can move to the next one. So for Bob to, to report in here, I would say last major issue on his side. Thanks. I don't see any slides for Bob in the decks to share. Um, and that, that's that's what that's what what I was. Saying is that for the first two ones for the architecture and the read there is no slides. Okay. The slide is only for for two. The last I would say a sub sub item. So as there is no major issue for the arc. I suggest that Bob can jump in and uh, and come on the the read uh, draft and then we can move to uh, to to see what for the uh, for the STM uh, update. Got it. Okay. Thank you. No problem. So I think, yeah. Did you want me to proceed with this one? I believe so. Okay. So like. uh, we all know our first RFC has been published. And then um, at right about the same time as our uh, requirements and terminology were published, uh, the ASTM F-38 committee, which is the Unmanned Aircraft System uh, Operations Committee, uh, entered ballot on two UAS RID documents. One of them is the revision of F-3411-19, which has been the basis of most of our work. There was extensive, uh, okay, it went away. Um, there was extensive work um, done on um, F-3411 in order to uh, keep up with the regulatory changes in both the US and in Europe. Uh, we didn't have a lot of uh, inputs from the rest of the world. Um, the ballot has since closed uh, a few days ago, and there was only one uh, negative ballot. The way ASTM works, that one negative ballot must be resolved. In other words, either the chair needs to convince the one who filed that ballot to um, uh, rescind it, 
uh, or the uh, working group needs to find the ballot non-persuasive and then a higher level within the ASTM needs to agree with that decision that it was non-persuasive. This may take a while because it's an allegation of, of intellectual property conflict of interest. Fortunately, the means of compliance, which is a document saying how to satisfy an FAA regulation um, based upon the technical standard passed unanimously. Um, the picture in the middle is just an illustration of the um, flow, if you will, of requirements uh, from external uh, down to our um, proposed standard drafts. Um, as you know, the architecture draft is uh, just entered IETF last call this morning. Um, there are some nits there. Now, we wonder, and this is not a question for IETF, but I just want you all to be aware of the question, whether we're also going to need to come up with a means of compliance draft to show how our um, DRIP uh, RFCs, once published, can be used to address the uh, things that the ASTM F3411 standard does not address, which is primarily how to dynamically assign session IDs, ensure that they are trackable by authorized parties only back to um, the operator and the um, serial number of the aircraft. Um, and we had a successful field test last summer, which we're going to do another one this summer. And we're hoping at that point to check the interoperability of our prototypes with those of others. And that is all I have. Thank you. Any comments or questions? Okay, then. Thanks. I think next item up is... Any questions? Sorry. Any questions or comments? I can't hear you. Any questions or comments? Nobody? Okay then, thanks. We'll move on to the next item on the agenda. Which, Which is implementation. Yep. Hello everybody, can you hear me well? Hi Andre, perfect. Okay, so this is an update that we were developing in, in Linköping University with students re regarding implementation of, of DRIP um, protocols. Next slide. So this is our reference architecture. So there is a, like five components, uh, observer with uh, Android application app, uh, the, the drone with Raspberry Pi and other add-ons like GPS and battery and uh, then the registry based on Iroha blockchain, which keeps track of um, uh, drone data. And then there are different types of users that can request this uh, uh, data from, from blockchain. So next I will describe like the progress of different components. So code is uh, using open heap implementation of host identity protocol with different uh, additions. And it's a uh, part which is open source. So um, some changes which are upcoming uh, because of change both with in uh, hierarchical hits format, we'll need to address that. And second part is the mostly Python trips to handle this um, registration and uh, lookup messages. So it's uh, not currently published, but we work to do it um, towards the end of the year. Next slide. So the, the drone broadcasts uh, things using STM uh, format with drip additions based on extension of drone ID. And um, we experiment with Wi-Fi uh, different modes as well as Bluetooth 4 and Bluetooth 5. Um, we ha also have uh, like uh, registry implementation using Iroha, as I mentioned, uh, as well as extension of Android app to, to do the lookups based uh, for web server. Next one. So why uh, Iroha, it's a blockchain that is permission-based and it has some nice uh, features. So we actually did also some simulations to understand what kind of uh, number of drones it can handle. And it's quite promising. So it's like, let's say, hundreds of drones within a certain limited geographical arrays is uh, supported in terms of transaction times and uh, processing times and so on. And uh, next, it's also, next slide please. It's also supporting uh, some of um, all, all the requirements that are specified in the DRIP registry draft. Uh, so I hope uh, it will be also included as one option in the future of um, revision of registries uh, draft that Adam is uh, promoting. 
Next. So I'm now going to talk briefly about our experiments with Bluetooth 5. Quite many devices claim now they support Bluetooth 5, but it seems like not all features are actually supported. So for example, Raspberry Pi 4 is not really supporting it well enough. So we were trying to experiment with a dongle and development kit RF52480 to sort of test the range and other features. Next slide. I have a question. Yes. Um, when you say it does not support, um, uh, what is not support exactly? Um... Well, as you know, there are different profiles, for example, long range Bluetooth 5 or low low battery Bluetooth 5. So it means like it maybe supports some limited version of this. OK. So okay, right. um, if you don't mind, Andre, I'll expand on that a little bit. Basically, a lot of hardware chips will support Bluetooth 5, the spec, is an extension of Bluetooth 4, but all of the extensions for Bluetooth 5 are optional, the only one being backport to Bluetooth 4. So you could have a chip that supports all the new features of Bluetooth 5, but then the firmware running the chip doesn't, and then the software above that at the OS level doesn't, and then the software above that doesn't. So you get this layering problem of the chip will support all the stuff, but then stuff above it won't. And so you have to okay. find the right match to do it. So for example, the only phone I've found that supports everything we need for Bluetooth 5 is Samsung Galaxy S10 or S20 smartphones. Mm. Right, so we were trying to address this, for example, by plugging this dongle into, into Raspberry Pi 4. And uh, But as you said, uh, there are some complications on firmware and driver level. So we, we only had limited success with that so far. Uh, next slide. Uh, but yeah, we have a, a script which using Python extensions, and then it's uh, depending on which uh, in, uh, communication interface is active and available, it will try to send Wi-Fi bacon mode or Bluetooth 5 or 4 and so on. Next slide. So for Wi-Fi, um, it uh, works, but it's a short range, uh, maybe some. Uh, less than 100 meters. So we were also looking at the neighborhood awareness uh, mode, which is getting support in the recent phones. Uh, however, uh, people like Bob pointed out that now Wi-Fi bacons is, is a way to go, but uh, I'm not sure what's the level of support of that in the recent hardware we have to investigate. Next slide. And this is the observer application. It's based on uh, Open drone ID extension, as, as you can see, it successfully receives H hits from the drones and displays location as well, allows to query uh, the database, the registry based on uh, user credentials. Uh, next slide. And regarding the Bluetooth 5, uh, we did some measurements. Um, it's not so easy to find the, like one kilometer open space in Sweden, so we actually had to go to the, to the lake. And uh, with this uh, development kit, we were able to reach about one Nordic mile distance, which is already much better than, uh, let's say, 100 meters with, with Wi-Fi. So once we uh, kind of resolve this compatibility issue with Bluetooth 5 in, in different devices, hopefully it will be good means. Next slide. So as you see, these are components we, we have to combine and put it like uh, add-on to, to uh, let's say, a Phantom drone. So there is Raspberry Pi uh, 4, then there is battery hat, and then there is GPS. So all of that should be like mounted on a drone to actually uh, transmit this um, uh, ID data. Um, well, uh, now actually there is model B of uh, Raspberry Pi 4, so I hope it will have better uh, Bluetooth 5 support, so maybe we can do without a, a dongle extension. Uh, so simplifies things. Next slide. And uh, regarding um, OpenHIP, uh, it's currently hosted on, on Bitbucket, so you can uh, download the code there. Next. So one of the things we were trying to do is to add uh, support for OpenSSL 3.0, because it's like the latest crypto library, which has all the latest uh, ciphers and hashes and so on. And uh, uh, OpenHIP is a 
it's historically based on OpenSSL 1.0, and then it was extended a little bit to 1.1.0, but still, like, not the latest one. Next. Uh, so it was kind of challenging because Open uh, Heap uses a lot of uh, uh, sort of deprecated uh, calls, which are now not supported in SSL 3.0 anymore. And when when you start changing one part, it sort of leads to dependencies in the other parts. So it was like uh, basically almost re rewrite of the code because it was like thousands of warnings and other stuff. Next slide. But uh, we kind of finished the, the update, so the code is compiled, uh, but it's not uh, well tested yet. So we uh, maybe in autumn we will work on more um, automatic tests to sort of uh, and packet format tests to, to make sure it's um, uh, like interoperable and compatible to the latest RFCs. Next. Also, we were working about uh, NAT traversal implementation. So you see this RFC 9028 is relatively fresh from, from uh, July. Uh, so again, we, we finished basic implementation, but more testing is, is needed. Um, but I'm curious to see your uh, opinion, uh, like is it really helpful for, for DRIP? Do we need uh, to go like over UTP and use ICE, or we assume that we, we can have like always direct Heap and IPsec in all in all cases. Maybe at least for the kind of reg remote registry access, maybe it's useful. Next, uh, so we still so there is something to do. So there is like data relay server implementation to do, and uh, update the core simulator that we used for for these use cases. Next, please. So what we are also doing is we are trying to do formal verification. Um, like I know, for example, Bob likes this idea that the security protocol should be formally verified. And um, last attempt to do it for HIP, I think it was uh, like 10, 15 years ago. So we are now using more modern tool and also implement DRIP features. And uh, also we are involved in several EU projects, which are, um, targeting to do big scale demonstrations, like almost a drone flying taxi or ambulance. Um, so for example, there are some test beds plan in, in, Nor in uh, Norway, Skavander and in Helsinki. Um, so try to put some our prototype and, and hardware to, to these drones to broadcast a remote ID. And Xorus Quam is another example that uh, is also like large scale demonstration. So we plan to fly a big drone between two cities in Sweden, beyond light of sight. So maybe one of the first operations like that. And it also would be nice to, to have a DRIP as part of, of this thing. And uh, the final slide, please. Yeah, so this AR Moore is uh, focusing on emergency medi medical services because based on surveys, it seems like it's a kind of application area that most people will support the adoption of drones, even if it's noise and, and some other features. And um, you see there are some uh, Chinese uh, models like Ihang, uh, which is already purchased and uh, being tested uh, and uh, in, in Norway. And uh, they, of course, uh, waiting for some authorities' permissions to actually start flying people in that. So it's uh, ongoing um, research and uh, active area in, in new space in Europe. So that's it on my side, if there are any comments, questions. Thank you, Andre. If anyone's got any questions or comments, could you please put their hand up in the eTechO chat and then identify themselves when they speak. Also, if someone's speaking at all, please say who they are for the benefit of everybody in the room. Stuart is taking notes, and I'm sure he recognizes everybody's voice, but there may be other people who are taking part in the meeting. Sorry, Stuart is um, uh, taking notes of this meeting and he probably recognizes everybody's voice but other people are in the room here or on the internet somewhere else might not recognize who's speaking so can identify yourself when you come to the mic thank you very much um we have a first question from daniel yeah so um, i have uh one question to andrew uh, it's a um I mean, I, I don't see the, the, the migration to open SSL3 as a huge uh, challenge. Um, 
but uh, I just want to check if I am correct. Uh, well, in terms so of code, difficult, I mean, but, uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's uh, if you have like legacy code, it's like a lot of update. It's uh, almost mm. like rewriting from scratch. So I'm not sure yeah. about other people using heap. Are we going to do the upgrade or? Okay, because that uh, okay, that's not the rip. That's uh, on the hip side of it. Yes, but you need hip okay. right for for registration. Yeah, 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 sure. Yeah, I forgot this. Uh, <laughs> okay, thanks, Bob. Pointing out, as I said in the in the uh, chat, that. Um, the value, one of the big values of, of HIP for the UA is going to be for network remote ID and command and control um, and not being locked into a single um, connection methodology. He has demonstrated this already um, in his test over at the uh, UAS test site there in his, back, in his uh, neighborhood there at Griffith International Air Force Base. We presented that in previous uh, sessions, so uh, um, you may think that this is orthogonal, the, the, the open hip discussion, um, but it is going to be important as we move forward to the next steps in being able to, to well support the uh, activities for um, um, where we go beyond um, the basic broadcast messages and we start moving on to the network remote ID and and uh, support for their support for command and control. And that's it. Go ahead, Stuart. To clarify, while command and control itself uh, does not lie strictly within the scope of the DRIP working group. Recreating applications based upon identity does. And so that would include so-called detect and avoid, command and control, uh, vehicle to infrastructure, vehicle to vehicle, etc. Daniel? Andrea has presented one implementation. Um, I guess to and Adam as another implementation. Um, did you do some uh, inter interoperability test, or um, um, are, are we aware of uh, any other implementation at that point? And uh, um, maybe if if that's possible, um, Adam or Stu, um, can you just uh, let us know? Um, uh, what your implement? I mean, uh, are you doing the equivalent of uh, Andre's, or is that um, uh, more restrained or more specific? Um, I mean, if it's possible, I'd like to have some more detail. I would be interested. Okay. So is just that a brief time is check here. Uh, we are about ten minutes late right now, so keep it brief, please. Adam, do you want to take this, or do you want me to? Please go ahead, Stuart, but be brief. Okay, so I'll make it very quick. Um, Adam and others um, at the New York UAS test site are doing a tremendous amount of work in prototyping. Unfortunately, the nature of our funding is such that it is a struggle to get any of it uh, openly released. We will continue the struggle. Thank you, Stuart. Next up. All right. Yep, thanks. I uh, hope everyone can hear me. Uh, so I'm going to go over two topics today. I'm going to go over authentication formats uh, and also the registries. So I'll start with authentication formats because that'll be pretty pretty quick on us. Um, so changes since 03, the FEC section is now fully filled in. It will need somewhat of an extensive review. Uh, there were a couple small things that were changed on uh, two of the formats. Appendix A was fully filled in with some diagrams and some text, and Appendix D was added uh, for to do Med's comment. Um, so, so there's some, still some pending issues. As I said, FEC needs to get reviewed. Um, I've noticed that with Reed Solomon, especially in my implementation, that you need a specific polynomial on both sides for the forward error correction to even properly work. 
and I have run into an issue where I've had colliding polynomials. So we might have to actually specify one in the draft. I'm not sure how to approach this. So I'd like some guidance on that, or we can just work on it as a working group together. The Appendix D was to directly address a comment from Med. Uh, hopefully it satisfies his comment along with the conjunction with Appendix A. And then I need to loosen some language. There's some weird language during some transition where manifest became the required and thing, but it used to be wrapper, but it seems like both can be used. So I have to just fix some of the wording around in that to get it right. Uh, for next steps on this draft, I'm going to be sending it uh, internally in AX Enterprise to Laura Welch for an English language review. She's uh, very good at English uh, and maybe not so much on the technical side, but she'll be able to read through the draft, make it readable to humans that are not technically as savvy and help find any major issues. Um, I actually just got the sector review uh, right before this meeting. So I'm going to be responding to uh, Rich uh, after this. He's given some great comments. And I believe we're ready for working group last call, although the chairs can uh, put their own opinion out on it. So anything discussion-wise on off from anybody? Otherwise, I'll continue straight into registries. I'm going to take that as nothing, so I'll go right into registries. So this is the registries draft. We're on version 01 now uh, from 00. So changes from 00. Uh, this was a massive rewrite on my part. The first push was an absolute mess. I hated the document as it was, so I took some time, about a week and a half, and really cleaned it up, reorganized it. Uh, there's some new sections in the introduction to get a high level of view of like a story of a typical life cycle using the registries in DRIP. Uh, there was a whole section of attestations and certificates that was moved down into the appendix because in line it was getting really clunky to read the document. Um, there was some text added for key rollover and federation of registries, which I'll touch on a little bit later. Uh, and there was an attempt at merging high level points from the DEET section five into the section four of this document. I'm gonna be working more with Bob to make sure that I got all the pieces needed for that and massage any text there. Um, the big change from this was sections seven and sections eight of zero zero were merged into one section, section six. So that got a lot cleaner in formatting and was more fleshed out. Section seven uh, in the original document was extremely technical and just very hard to read, where section eight was more of prose and like a story and how registration works with the inner components. They've been melded together in a lot, hopefully an easier way to understand. Also, EPP and RDEP sections were added and uh, any examples that were shown in the EPP section have been come have came out of the AX implementation. Um, so the title of the document is currently going to change when we go to O2, um, and the title will be Drip Entity Tags Registration and Lookup. And this is mainly the primary focus of the draft. It's lookup and the registration of DEETs and other information associated around the DEET. Um, DRIP is not bound to DNS, EPP, or RDAP. Um, I think there might have been a little bit of a misconception that this was going to be the only way for it to work. No, that wasn't the intention. It is, we're going to use DNS, EPP, and RDAP as a baseline to get something out the door standardized and working for deploying. And then also, DRIP is not exactly bound to the D. This has come up in previous meetings. There was no, there has been no other solution being put forward. But if one does come later in the registries, um, the registration architecture that we currently have is strongly tied to the drip entity tags HID structure, the RAA HDA split. So if someone wants to write another registry draft, either one, they need to mimic the HID in their identifier, or two, produce a whole new registration architecture 
using their new um, identifier format and hierarchy. Um, and that's a bridge we will go across if we need to, but I tried to make it so that the document was clear that this ties with the DEET. And if something else comes along, uh, it would be a different draft. So pending issues, um, there was a error on my part when I pushed. Um, I was asked to do a contributor section. I accidentally copied and pasted the full acknowledgement section into the contributor section. So Scott Hollenbeck was pulled into the contributor section um, and I didn't realize that I had done this. So he has been pulled back out in a uh, running version that's on my side and he's back as an acknowledgement. Uh, Andre was pulled as a contributor. Uh, speaking of Andre, uh, I actually oversighted and lost his e text email um, a couple months ago. I found it again, so I have the text again, um, and I will be adding it in uh, per Andre's uh, presentation a little bit earlier. Um, I don't know if this is an appendix or if it's going in line. I believe it's an appendix, and that's where I'm going to put it for now, and then we'll go from there. Uh, Scott Hollenbeck on the mailing list gave a really great suggestion in breaking the EPP and RDAP sections out into separate documents. I like the suggestion, but I want to feel the working group out to see if we want to do such a thing and add more documents to the listing. Um, I need to work with Bob, and I've already discussed it with him, about pulling text for the RAA and HDA into this draft. So. Hopefully that will happen in the next couple of weeks and then I'll push O2 out. Um, so the rest of this time, well, actually, Bob, let's take your question because I have plenty of time. Just uh, quickly, uh, the, the comment about moving text uh, from uh, RID to registries. Um, just if I move text from, from RID to auth, um, we start with the text in RID to get it kind of laid out and once the uh, um, where it belongs started um, evolving, um, we moved the text. So uh, um, Adam and I will, just as we do with us, we'll be pulling text out of RID and moving it where it belongs in registries. Um, so everything I think will be cool for everybody on there. And then I'll show up in the uh, my next draft, the RID 18 draft, and, uh, and, and Adam's next draft on registries. Thanks, Bob. Okay, so I want to spend the rest of the 15 minutes of this uh, to go over some registration process stuff. Um, this is the first time I think this has been presented to the working group. This has been internal uh, to, well, basically myself and Stu for the past year. Um, and I'm finally getting the chance to kind of go a little bit more in detail to it. So just as a recap, this is our registry tree diagram. This is how the registries are laid out in hierarchy. We have a single root registry, which takes the values of zero and zero for the RAA and the HDA. And then there's two branches of the tree. There's a branch on the left that consists of the IRM and the MRA, which uh, is mostly dealing with serial numbers. And then the branch on the right, which deals with other RAAs, mostly under civil aviation authorities. And they have uh, values of RAAs greater than two and HGAs greater than one. And then of course, an unmanned aircraft would register with two different registries in the system, one for its serial number and one for its session ID. And then with broadcast rate going to the observer and then DNS and RDAP lookups happening over the internet. So we have three major typical registration operations. The serial number registration at the manufacturer into the MRA, and that's usually a D encoded as an ANSI CTA 2063-A serial number. And this is documented in the DEET draft that Bob has. There's an operator registration at what is nominally would be considered a USS, but it's actually specifically the uh, remote ID registry uh, portion of DRIP. And this key and DEET would be used by the operator during session ID registration. And then finally, session ID registration also at that USS or that uh, remote ID registry. And that is a DEET proposed to be used by the UA 
uh, during flight for that given flight. So this is a uh, Z diagram. It's not perfect. There are some issues with this that I'd like to fix, but to get us started. Um, so this is serial number registration into the MRA or the Manufacturer's Registry of Aircraft. Basically, at the start of time, the manufacturer would build an unmanned aircraft. They most likely will generate the key pair and the uh, drip entity tag associated with that unmanned aircraft. If the unmanned aircraft can't create the key pair itself, uh, and they would propose it to the manufacturer's registry using uh, a self attestation. There's some internal stuff that goes on, extracting the drip entity tag, checking for collisions in both the database and the DNS. Um, so to make a comment that I've gotten from Stu recently on these slides, there's a reason that DNS and database are different or split apart on this. The database mostly holds a personally identifiable information or PII or just other additional information. Uh, in this particular scenario, um, we would be holding UA information, the UA's weight, how many rotors it has, what color is it, um, make and model, obviously, um, what type of battery um, um, chemistry it has. And this is so that people can easily look that stuff up and not have to scrape web pages. Um, once everything is completed, though, during a registration, resource records are added into DNS, private information is added to the database, the serial number, the public key, the, the, the drip entity tag, and any attestations that are produced are pushed into the unmanned aircraft in a secure element, hopefully. So this is uh, two examples. These are pulled from the uh, drip registry draft as it is stands right now. Uh, on the left is an EPP uh, command uh, for registering a serial number. And as you can see, all of the fields here are, you know, make model, color, material, those kinds of things that would end up in the database. And then on the right is our inputs and our outputs and also our DNS entries, what fields of DNS exist or what resource records in DNS exist for a given serial number. Now, while the serial number is useful and we can create a serial number using a DEET and that helps for modules, the real important one for DRIP is the session ID, which is what the DEET is acting as. It's acting as a UAS uh, session ID. So a very similar process happens with a session ID. Um, hopefully the aircraft can create their own key pair um, in this scenario. So basically the operator would poke the aircraft, it would generate its key pair, send it along with a serial number and additional information around back to the operator who acts as basically a middleman between the aircraft and the registry software. Passing it back and forth uh, we have the same ki kinds of checks for collision checking with the deets in all the varying parts. And once it's done, uh, importantly for this, the broadcast attestation is generated. And this is vital as in DRIP, we require that the broadcast attestation be sent over the air uh, in the authentication message. This is what the auth draft is all about. And this is where that broadcast attestation comes from. And this is all handed back to the unmanned aircraft through the operator. There are other ways to cut this cake. Um, you know, we could have the unmanned aircraft reach through an LTE connection right to the remote ID registry. That is a valid way of doing it. This is just one of a different, many different ways to uh, do this process. Uh, again, this is some examples. So on the left, which is not the same as the last slide. Uh, these are the DNS entries that would be in uh, the remote ID registry, along with what inputs and outputs were needed for the registration to occur. And then on the uh, right is the EPP, is an example of the EPP that is sent. Um, there is a couple things in the uh, EPP that we have not discussed in this working group, and 
one of the major things is the operational intent. The operational intent is basically the UTM link back into UTM to get the uh, 4D volume box if uh, the if they are participating in UTM. So some next steps on the registry draft. Uh, I want some feedback on the EPP examples. That would be absolutely lovely. Um, I need to produce some RDAP examples. We haven't gotten into that yet. Uh, there, as I said before, there's. I talked about some federations and key rollover. It's an interesting topic because we are going to have to probably federate registries. And with the H hit or the D acting as its identifier and the last 64 bits being the hash, it will be interesting to see how this works because the HID would be the same. You could have a registry like the root registry is 00, zero but you could produce two to the 64 keys and they'll all have different hashes, but it's all technically the same registry. So I'm curious how this would affect deployment and use of the system. Um, I don't have any free cycles to explore that topic, even on a crypto security level. So if there's any takers for that, that'd be really interesting. And we can add that text into the draft. And I hope to have an interim, uh, not directly after this, but maybe a couple weeks, a month from now, as to focus on the Z diagrams. They're, the two Z diagrams I showed you are two out of 22 uh, Z, Z diagrams that I have. Um, and they're, I would like to do a deep dive with the working group and anyone that's interested to understand the process and the flow that we've had in our heads for the past year and a half on how registries would work to get it into the draft a little bit better. Uh, and with that, I think I'm ready just to take some discussion if anyone has anything to discuss. For the first time, I think I am not rushed for time and I have eight minutes. Thank you very much, Adam, and that's a great job. Good time. Thank, you. <coughs> Thank you. Any questions or comments? Going, going, gone. If I may. Yep. Um, I, I've only got one. Um, and this, at the moment, this is mostly focused on um, Adam's uh, registries draft, where there's a question of how much detail to include on EPP and RDAP as uh, specific techniques for implementing the registries, and also to some extent on the um, architecture draft. I, I feel like we kind of have a failure to commit here. To achieve interoperability, we need specifics. And abstraction is a fine thing, but getting abstractions right takes a long time. And the bus is leaving the station uh, with regard to regulations and manufacturers building um, um, application-specific integrated circuits and so on. So we're really going to have to come to some decisions rapidly on how much specific protocol detail to include in these documents versus how much to attempt to continue to remain abstract and then produce still more documents that will have the details uh, slash rant. Bob? To the uh, concern about the multiple um, HITs per RAA RA or, or, or HTA is as being an issue. That's actually how, how key rollover will be achieved um and and how they'll be linked into registries so and that was part of my original thoughts when i first came up with this idea um it's just that now adam and i are going to, have to sit down and get the uh, done over the over the next uh, two months um so that that's uh, in there it and, and it's as uh, students said in an implementable way so i'll uh say this to a little bit to bob but just as in general so i knew that key role that that was used for key rollover but what struck me as interesting was that we have a root server hda ra0 hda0 and there's only one of them in the registry tree and obviously having that sync having it as a single server is a point of failure so you would probably want to have multiple root servers kind of like how dns works now 
Um, the problem with that in, I think in our thing is, is like, if you want to have an asymmetric key pair to generate the hit and thus the D, et cetera, you would need to have a different key on every box. So if you had say seven root servers, they're all going to have different key pairs. How is this managed? Right? Cause who you don't want a, uh, malicious party joining the club just because they created a key pair you would want to there needs to be some sort of control on that and this happens at every level of the registry tree and that was where my thought of federation and interest in the key rollover and the keys came in but it is a discussion we need to have overall No more comments, questions? Um, Bob, I think you wanted to have a quick word about the status of the RID draft, but I think that may have been overtaken by events, judging by the comments uh, in the chat. Um, barely here, I got my sound cranked crank all the way up, but um, just again, um, the slides for the RID that I have permitted are proposed are out there. I put the URL again in the uh, chat. Um, it was also on the list. Basically, um, there's some, um, Med has a couple things he wants me to address. Um, they are um, easy to do. We work on them next week. Uh, it, IANA says they are going to do a review of the new IANA considerations. Um, I added a lot of text in there. So they may have a lot of comments. Um, but uh, Ian and I will work that through. Uh, but uh, ex I'm parking for the end of next week to have dash 18 out. So if you have any comments on what I have in dash 17, please get them to me in the beginning of the week so I can get them included. Thank you. Okay. Um, you so I have one more thing to add to the meeting. This is what I get for not putting it on the slide. <laughs> um, so this is to answer Daniel a little bit earlier when uh, Andre had finished his presentation. Uh, my intent, if all the stars align and the universe is nice to me, is that in Philadelphia at IETF 114, I would like to do a demonstration of the AX implementation of UAS Remote ID. And I want to do a full, a full uh, demonstration. I'll have an aircraft, I'll have a puck, I will create, well, I'll have the software loaded on the puck, but I will perform serial number registration and session ID registration and fly the aircraft and pick it up with uh, the AX uh, Android application. So I do intend to have a implementation share. Uh, also to answer Daniel um, from earlier, uh, AX has worked with another uh, partner in UTM that was developing a remote ID uh, application. Uh, and it was not drip specific, it was ASTM only, but our implementation did work with theirs. So we were able, they were able to see our identifier, we were able to see their identifier, their side just kind of made it garbled garbage on their UI, but that was because they didn't know how to decode it. They just took the raw bytes and just displayed them and they were seeing all the pieces um they just didn't know what to do with all the pieces uh as for for with andre uh i would like to do an an interop test with him uh we'll coordinate that somehow it's kind of hard to do an interop coordination when you're on the <laughs> other side of the world at times but uh we i do intend to work with andre and get in, uh interop with drip to drip uh Maybe 114 is the answer. Maybe it isn't. I'm not quite sure. But as 114 draws closer, we'll have a better picture on that. Okay. Okay. Thanks uh, for the response. Has anyone got anything else to say? I guess not. Okay. This meeting of the Dish Working Group is closed. I would like to thank the speakers. Um, and also for doing a fantastic job of keeping to the time, even though I screwed it up at the start by being unable to make me tackle work properly. And I'd also like to thank my fellow delegate, Stefan, for his efforts today, and also to Eric for applying me tackle clue where it was badly needed. So thank you to everybody, and I hope to see you all in Philly. Cheers.
Thank you. Thanks, everyone. How did you manage that? <laughs> uh, uh. Yeah, I'd really just like to say thank you very much, uh, Jim and Stefan. Cheers. Much appreciated, Sue. Hope we can have a beer together in Philly. Awesome.